we're trying to build it similar to what they built it back in World War II. The replica shape and radar reflectivity must be exactly the same as the original to make the stealth testing valid. Metallic paint will be used instead of real fuel tanks and engine parts. Just painting the back of the wings is enough to represent the tanks? Yeah, because actually at the frequencies and the wavelengths that these radars worked at, they were very long. And this was an aluminum metallic tank. And I think if we paint it with some conductive materials, it'll represent part of the structure of that tank to the radar. We're actually going to be painting in this back area here. And, and probably we will do some outside painting when the vehicle is fully assembled. Now it's going to be getting it to stay, gluing it. You sign it. It doesn't want to. For the Northrop Grumman modeling crew, building a replica Nazi jet fighter is a rare chance to show off their skills. Usually everything that goes on in this workshop is highly classified. It's nice to have a, the chance to build these models and then they get, we see what they look like before they even become in a production. They'll construct the wings in two major sub-assemblies. First, they'll build a long curved leading edge, wrap it in wood, and then bolt it to the main wing panel. It's being built in about a quarter of the time that a normal RCS model would be built. Usually this takes, this is a year effort, and we're doing this in, what, three months. Give me a nail right here, because I know I'm good here. I didn't even know there was something this advanced in those days, and I can imagine what it might have done to the war if it, they would have got successful with it. Okay, ready? Right now. Right. Right. Let's start at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Can't let go of this. It's popping. Um, come around. Like yeah. That. Keep going down. A combination of traditional craftsmanship and modern tools will recreate the 1940s flying wing. Using foam uh, to manufacture the wingtip of the Horton aircraft. Machining it is just a lot easier. So, by carefully uh, controlling what kind of paint that we put over it, it'll have the same uh, radar reflective properties as the wood that it's mounted onto. In little more than a week, they glue and nail together the 80 ribs that make up each of the outer wing panels. Rather than rebuild complex parts like the fuel tank, they use metallic paint to recreate an authentic radar signature. We're simulating what would normally be the fuel tank in the Horton. This is real silver paint. It's silver suspended in a polyurethane coating. And it's rather expensive, about $2,500 a gallon. OK, that'll look like two fuel tanks to radar. Using the same materials that German craftsmen applied more than 68 years before them, the modelers cover the Horton 229's wings with a plywood skin. Uh, it's always great to see uh, major sub-assemblies come together. One, two, three. One month into the project, the leading edges are complete and ready to be bolted to the outer wing panels. Down a little bit, and push it in. They also encounter the same wood warping problems the Germans had to overcome. There's a gap between the, the pieces because this piece of wood's warped out from the water. Uh, it looks like about a half inch. It's always a little warping, but that's why these guys designed it so they could uh, put a bunch of the fasteners in afterwards and just take care of the warping to get a really good solid assembly. We're just filling it in with resin and cabosil, and we're going to put a, a layer of uh, fiberglass on there. And... To ensure there are no imperfections that could create errant radar reflections, the team spends hours in a cloud of fine dust, painstakingly sanding each wing. When they're testing the model up on the pole in RCS, uh, they don't like to see any humps and or sharp edges at all or gaps. Anything that it could, and it could be a rivet, it could be an edge, it could be anything, uh, they'll get a return. And that's not good. The Northrop Grumman Company has a long history of building wings. Like the Horton brothers, company founder Jack Northrop was convinced that tailless aircraft would one day revolutionize military aviation. 
More than a decade before the Nazis began working on their all-wing fighter, back in America, Jack Northrop was already test-flying his own wing designs. After the Second World War, the Northrop YB-49 became a lead contender in the race to make America's first intercontinental bomber. Now, decades later, the same company is recreating the flying wing of a former enemy. I'm work myself into the model. With the internal structure of the Horton 229 center body assembled, the modelers can start skinning it with plywood. That's good right there. We're using a flex board, wood that's not real strong, and the reason we're using it on the leading edge is so we can just, just use the one piece and wrap it around the bulkhead and the rib. We need a third hand here. Like the finished outer wing panels, they'll construct the complex shape of the center body mostly out of wood. To ensure the radar test results will be as accurate as possible, the modelers also have to replicate two of the most vulnerable areas on a stealth aircraft, the metal cockpit and inlets. The engine shrouds at the back of the cockpit are also being made out of a modern, more convenient alternative to metal. On the original uh, plane itself, it was welded steel. This is made out of our uh, carbon fiber, which is a lot lighter, easier to lay up, simulates the metal. To save time, instead of handcrafting complex parts like engine turbine blades, the model makers are using a fantastic plastic crafting instrument known as a sintering machine. It can recreate almost any shape by quickly and efficiently melting thin layers of powdered nylon. And this type of technology is called additive layer. And what it does is you start out with nothing and you make only what you need. We grow this overnight and it's completely finished. All the holes, everything is there. The turbine blades are finished and ready to be assembled in less than a day. But for the radar testing to work, they must ensure the nylon and fiberglass parts have the same reflective properties as the original German metal components. In the area of the inlets, what we end up doing is we take a reflective paint and we coat the outside of the shape so that from the radar standpoint, it doesn't know whether it's a piece of fiberglass underneath or it's a piece of uh, steel or aluminum. I think in, in the 40s, how the, the brothers made this canopy, they started off with a flat sheet, and they bend, screw it, heat it up, and just keep bending and forcing. The 229's cockpit is a big opening, making it vulnerable to radar. Modern stealth aircraft use special coatings on the canopy to prevent electromagnetic energy from entering the cockpit and bouncing back to the radar. I was thinking it this. To keep the replica as similar as possible to the original, the team uses 1940s material and techniques to form the cockpit cover. It turns out to be much harder than they thought. How do you say one, two, three in German? Yeah, we lost it. It's over. It's over. It ain't gonna work no more. We're done. We're gonna have to give it another shot. We're gonna cut this out so this area is relieved, and then this will lay down a lot better. Oh. After reheating the plexiglass, the team makes a second attempt to shape the canopy in one piece. Okay, nice effort. Nice effort. Open the one door. Open the door. Open the door. We're not going to give up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it in two pieces. I'm going to I'm going to eliminate half the problem. 
Meanwhile, the replica's body is being fitted with plastic inlets and nozzles covered in metallic paint. The radar is coming in this direction because the plane is heading towards the target. So the radar is coming in at this angle. And you have uh, turning fan blades here that reflect the radar. So uh, this is a very uh, vulnerable area on the aircraft for RCS. Let me get out of here, Mark. Let's start working on these nozzles and put the uh, phone in them. Clockwise. Clockwise. Right there. I don't think we need to move it other than to paint underneath it. I think we're ready. The carbon fiber engine shrouds are fitted to both sides of the cockpit. Like the wings, the center body is filled and sanded smooth to ensure the shape of the model is as close to the original aircraft as possible. With the outer wing panels attached, the last component of the center body is ready for installation. Yeah, I'm in the hole. Go ahead. Meanwhile, the layout and shapes inside the original cockpit have been faithfully replicated with pieces of plastic plumbing pipe. Uh, right. We need to find here. Okay. Something. Look at that, man. Having this all correct is really good because it, it's going to have all the correct surfaces for the radar to come in and reflect off, off of. So we really have a true representation of the real plane. With the cockpit and canopy installed, there's one last key job to ensure the plane is ready for radar testing. This paint is supposed to simulate real metal because we want this to be exactly like the real aircraft was. And right now I'm checking the resistance here of real metal and then I'm coming over here and comparing that to the, the metallized area we've painted, and they're identical right now, and that's exactly what we wanted to achieve here. Although assembly is complete, the team has less than two weeks to paint and finish the replica before its radar testing is scheduled to begin. 64 years earlier, the original Horton 229 was being ready for its first test flight, at a top-secret hangar inside Nazi Germany. It was mid-1944. Brothers Walter and Weimar Horton were overseeing preparations for the maiden flight of their 229 Batwing fighter. It was supposed to turn the tide of the war back in their beloved Führer's favor. The once mighty Luftwaffe had been emasculated. Allied bombers struck with impunity over the Reich. And on the 6th of June, Hitler suffered another crippling blow as the Allies landed at Normandy. By the autumn of 1944, work on the 229 was nearly complete when the brothers got word that the Führer was desperate for a new long-range bomber. Adolf Hitler had a dream of taking the war to the United States and would describe in detail to confidants like Speer how he dreamed of destroying cities like New York to knock down the skyscrapers, to leave them in flames. Reimer spent three weeks in December of 1944 designing the, the intercontinental bomber known as the Horton 18. It was going to be an expanded version of the Horton 229. As the Horton brothers worked in seclusion on Hitler's America bomber, their flying wing fighter was about to make history. A week before Christmas 1944, Luftwaffe test pilot Erwin Ziller watched as ground crews rolled the Batwing fighter from its secret hangar. Although a highly experienced test pilot, he was about to become the first to fly a jet-powered flying wing. The Horton 229 was generations ahead of, of any other aircraft developed in the world. And the Horton 229 had to be the most exotic piece of machinery in, in, in Germany at that time. In the chill of a midwinter dawn, Zilla nudged the throttles forward for takeoff. 